2022. There we are, and we're up and running. Uh, welcome to June 2022 uh, Crozet Community Advisory Committee. My name is Joe Four. I'm the chair of this committee, and it's wonderful to see you all uh, here tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I am coming to you, uh, at the time, I want you to know, I'm, I'm coming to you from the uh, Okanichi State Park down in Southside. Uh, I am currently on my uh, Wi-Fi through my phone's hotspot. Um, it seems to be holding out, but uh, if the Wi-Fi gets spotty, if you lose me, I see Mark McKinney up in my corner um, and he looks ready, willing and able to jump in and lead the meeting. I'll try to jump back on my phone. So I hope this holds out, but if anybody has any trouble hearing me or seeing me, please just raise a hand and, uh, and I'll reset. Um, let me get to our script. Tonight's meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with emergency ordinance number 20-A16, an emergency, emergency ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. The committee members who are electronically present at this meeting are myself, Joe Four, Costas Albertus, Mark McKenney. Actually, don't we, we usually introduce ourselves. Uh, so I will do that. Uh, let, let's go ahead and introduce the people who are here. Um, uh, Joe Four, Chair Costas, do you want to introduce, introduce yourself and tell us where in Crozet you are? Great. Uh, my name is Costas Alberis. I live out on 250 uh, in the area of Quarry Farm and Gateway. So kind of in between there. Mark? Yeah, Mark McKenney over in the West Hall neighborhood. Uh, Allie. Hi, I'm Allie. I live uh, by Men's Springs Park. Mike uh, Kunkel. Hi, uh, Mike Kunkel. I live in the uh, Quarry Farm. And Michael Monaco. Yeah, Michael Monaco, um, the Emerson Commons neighborhood. And I think I saw Valerie. Hi, I'm Valerie Long. I live in Old Trail. Uh, and I think, uh, let's see, who else did I say? Uh, Mallory. Ken. Oh, Mallory, that's right, Mallory. Hey, Mallory DeCoster, Western Ridge. Right, and Mallory, you are one of our new members, is that right? You also have Lonnie Murray, who's the new uh, planning commissioner for the Crozet District. He's here today. Wonderful, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, so welcome to Lonnie and Mallory. At the end of the meeting, we'll uh, give you guys a few minutes if you don't mind and maybe just introduce yourself so we can all get to know you because we're looking forward to having you at these meetings. Uh, and Ken, sorry, last but not least. Hi, everybody. Ken Thacker. Uh, I live on St. George Avenue, downtown Crozet. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And I see staff present. We also have uh, Rachel Falkenstein from uh, county staff. And Rachel, I don't I think there's no other staff. Everyone else is just from the right hand Water Service Authority. We have uh, Dave Tungby, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Victoria Fort uh, from the RWSA, I believe. Um, the persons responsible for receiving public comment are the Crystal Community Advisory Committee. The opportunities for the public to access and participate in this electronic meeting have been posted on the Albemarle County calendar. Okay, wonderful. We also have Carolyn Schaefer for clerk who's here tonight. Um, we do have a quorum present. I see that we have, well, I think we have 13 current members and we've got uh, more than seven folks here right now. So uh, Michael was kind enough to circulate the minutes shortly after last month's meeting. Um, I hope you all had a chance to look over those at least a, a bit. Um, I apologize for not including that in the materials that I sent out last week. I'll try to remember to do that in the future because Michael was so quick on the uptake. He got those out so quickly, uh, I forgot to reattach them. So thank you for that, Michael. Um, if there is a, a motion and a second, we can take up the approval of the minutes, which is our first agenda item. Second motion. Thank you, Costas. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mark. Motion has been made and seconded. All those uh, in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries and the minutes are approved. Thank you. 
Uh, we will move into our first agenda item uh, after the minutes, which is an update from the uh, Rivanna Water Service Authority. Um, I believe we have David who's going to be uh, Dave's going to be leading that presentation. Do I have that right, Dave? You do, Joe. Thanks. And, uh, right. and could, I'm sorry. Could you just tell us your? I want to make sure I pronounce your name correctly. Yeah, it's Tungate, Dave Tungate. Okay. Yep, and I'm I'm actually down the street from Mark. I'm in West Hall, so not only am I presenting on Ravana projects, but I'm also a, a a customer of the authority, essentially. So wonderful. Well, thank you, Dave. We'll turn it over to you. All right, great. Um, let me. Great, can anyone, everyone see my presentation? Yep. yep, perfect. So I wanted to take a minute and update the, um, the committee on some of our recent projects in the Crozet community. Um, Victoria Fort's on the phone with, uh, I guess on the, on the presentation with me also, she's a senior civil engineer and uh, her project is the, the Beaver Creek Dam. So I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna talk about that today. So if we have any questions, we can talk to her about that. We all of us recognize the picture here. This is uh, the Beaver Creek Reservoir taken from the Browns Gap Turnpike. Uh, ironically, uh, this, the concrete structure we see over on the right there, that's our intake, our current intake. And that's our drinking water intake, I should say, for the Crozet community. So um for those of us for those of you that don't know um the ravana water and sewer authority is a wholesale drinking water and wastewater treatment provider for the county we provide all the municipal water and wastewater treatment in the county we have two customers the city of charlottesville and Albemarle county service authority so if you're in the city of charlotte well um uh, the uva is a customer of the city of charlottesville and we provide bulk water to Admiral County Service Authority, and then they provide the retail service to those of us in, in Crozet. Um, some of our facilities in Crozet, we talked, I showed you the in the, in the first picture, we had a slide that showed the, the Beaver Creek Reservoir, of course. We have our, our, our current raw water intake and pump station, and I'm going to move your picture. So the intake is in the middle of the reservoir. Browns Gap Turnpike actually drives over the dam, for those of you that don't know. And as you're going over the dam, if you look to your, if you're going north, if you look right down at the bottom of the dam, there's a pump station down there. And that's the pumps that we use to, to uh, take water from the reservoir and pump it up to the plant. Um, the water treatment plant, if you can follow my mouse, is um, near the intersection of Old Three Notched and Three Notched. Um, we have a raw water pipeline that connects the two pump state, the pump station and the water treatment plant. And um, a little west of the water treatment plant on the same property, we have a ground storage tank that holds 500,000 gallons of finished water and we have a pump station. And then on, um, on uh, I think it's Beaver Mountain Road, just west of town, we have a tank, we have a tank on Buck's Elbow uh, Mountain. Those are the, those are our water facilities in Crozet. Um, there's a, another graph. Um, we all talked about the the reservoir. This is the the water treatment plant, and we had some renovations at the water treatment plant, which we're going to talk about later. This is a new finished water pump station, and then uh, this is the Buck's Elbow tank, which is located uh, just just west of Buck Road. The Crozet wastewater facilities is a little bit different. We actually pipe the wastewater from Crozet through a series of pump stations, the first of which is at the intersection of 240 and 250. Um, and we pump it uh, four, well, three more times all the way to the John Deere dealer on 250. That's the last pump station. Uh, and then it pumps it into a into a water main and, uh, into a sewer main and it flows by gravity to the Morris Creek wastewater treatment plant uh, over in Belmont if, if those of you are familiar so um, the wastewater from the Cozy service area travels through five miles of piping and four pump stations to get to Morris Creek uh, wastewater treatment plant we actually have a series we have two odor control facilities at these pump stations one a pump station 
three, the one at pump station one, um, and we feed odor control chemicals into the sewage so that um, people driving 242, I mean, people driving 250 don't smell uh, the odors. And so since um, um, it's, it's important for us to sort of be unnoticed in the community. So it's not uncommon um, for us to get some calls from time to time, particularly high flow events that people complain about, about an odor smell, but um, it's something we take very seriously. Um, so recent capital improvements in the Crozet area. In 2018, we finished a granular activated carbon um, treatment system. This is the big building, which you see just to the immediately to the west <coughs> of the water treatment plant, excuse me, on 240. Um, looks like a big red barn. Uh, we have two granular activated carbon vessels in there. And really what those are, um, are big Brita filters, Brita carbon filters. Each unit contains uh, 20,000 pounds of activated carbon. Um, it's something that we change out on um, a 12 to 15 month basis. We take tests and determine when the carbon is spent. Um, the carbon that you see here has a treatment capacity of a million gallons a day uh, with both vessels. They, uh, they run in, a, um, in parallel flow. The project was completed in April of 18 and it cost uh, $3.4 million. Um, then immediately after that project was completed, there, well, there was a project going on at the same time as the Grangler Activated Carbon Project, and we updated um, our finished water pump station. Uh, the finished water pump station that was there was the original from the 60s, um, and it exceeded its useful life. So if you're familiar with the area, we moved the finished water pump station up the hill a little bit closer to 240. Um, again, matched the same architecture as the, the Crozet um, GAC facility with the red sides and the, and the beige roof. Um, this facility has a pumping capacity of 2 million gallons a day. It costs 2.6 million. Those of you that live um, immediately adjacent or anyone lives adjacent to the, to the, to the uh, water treatment plant. We do have a generator. The generator that we had there was not what they call a silent run generator. So we have a, a more quiet generator. So if, for instance, last week when the community lost power, at least at my house here in West Hall, um, you know, we, were, we were able to provide continuous service with backup generators that, that run. So we can provide both water and wastewater services, which is pretty important if you, uh, if you don't have those, as we all know. Um, and the picture below, these are the picture of the pumps um, in, this, in this pump station here. We have two um, finished water pumps um, with a total pumping capacity of 2 million gallons a day. The wastewater treatment plant finished up in March of 21. This is an aerial photo of the facility. So 240 is at the bottom of this picture. Um, so this is actually looking south. Um, uh, we have the filtration plant, which we upgraded the filters, um, all the chemical handling, all the pumps. Um, we inc uh, increased the reliability of the system. Uh, we added uh, some just some newer technology to the treatment plant. And then <clears throat> this is the GAC. This is the GAC facility right here, which we were seeing earlier. And then we added a chemical storage building on the back where we can uh, more efficiently store and use our chemicals for water treatment process. And then the most popular thing to my kids are, so on the north side of 240, we had these two backwash lagoons, which was water that was processed water when we treat um, for treating the water at the plant. So when I say that, that's not wastewater, there's no human waste in there. There is um, sedimentation, sed basin blowdown, backwash water. So just as part of the process of treating and filtering water, we did create <clears throat> some water and some waste um, sludges and whatnot. And they went over in two lagoons on the side, on the north side of 240. And so we made a change in our philosophy and sort of change in how we're doing things. We <clears throat> took the westernmost lagoon and made it a concrete storage tank. So the processed water goes in that tank there. We settle out the solids or we settle out the sludge and we pump the sludge over to 
the uh, it's connected up to the sanitary sewer. So um, we, we we're, it's covered now because we had a big problem with leaves and um, animals getting in there. So now we have it covered up. And then the lagoon to the east is there on a, on a backup basis if we needed it to provide some redundancy. So to go back, the water treatment plant was expanded from one to two million gallons a day capacity. It was completed in March of 2021 and, and the cost was $8.5 million. Um, $8.5 million. So some of our current near-term improvements, um, we have a Crozet wastewater flow equalization tank project going on now. And if you go on 250 after 240, so you stay on 250 and don't go uh, uh, right on 240, you can look over and, and you'll see a big tank. It looks, this is a picture that was taken a little while ago. It looks a little bit different from now, but it's in there and you can see this tank. So it's, it's located, here's the, here's 250, here's 240. The tank is right here where the star is. And, and really what it does is it's a 1 million gallon storage tank and it will store wastewater during peak flows. Um, and then when the flows go back down again, we'll put that tank online and slowly bring the water back through the pump stations. Um, it's sort of a neat process um, to, to avoid a, a, more, a larger capital project, which would involve larger sanitary sewer lines and larger pump stations. Um, wastewater, as you would imagine, does have a diurnal curve. Um, <clears throat> first thing everyone does, get up in the morning, use the bathroom, take a shower. So our system sees a higher flow rates between six and nine, and then it settles back down again, particularly in Crozet, which is typical, which is the bedroom community for Charlottesville and Augusta County and el elsewhere. So we'll see a higher flows early in the morning. And then again, at this time of day, when everyone comes home, cooks dinner, gives kids baths and whatnot. So um, we're able to store peak flows in this, in this storage tank. And then when the, the flows go down midday, we're able to, to uh, open the valves and let that come back through. So that project is going on now. Um, it, tr it also trims the, the wet weather flows. So when we have high rain events, at times the sanitary sewage and the rainwater can mix and the flows pick up. Um, it should be completed in November and the cost is $5.4 million. Uh, Crozet pump stations one through four, we have a rehabilitation project. And again, as I showed earlier, these are on 250 going east to Charlottesville. Um, it, it conveys the wastewater to the urban system, to, to the urban system and the Morris Creek wastewater treatment plant. Uh, re, you're just rehabilitating equipment that are at, at the end of their current useful life. Um, the completion should be 2024 and uh, the current estimate on the project is $600,000 um, with supply chain issues and contractor issues. This is an estimate now. Uh, we haven't finished the design and, and, and the bidding process. So that's our estimate. Um, what you see here, the buildings, which are kind of tucked away a little bit, unless you're really looking for them. Um, but then they have uh, what you're seeing here. This is some of the sewage in, in these wet wells. And then we have pumps that pump that into a force main and into a main and sends it east to Charlottesville. Sort of the, the topic that most know about um, is the Beaver Creek Dam pump station and piping modifications. Um, this is a picture uh, looking, this is the dam. So we're sort of looking east here. Uh, this is Beaver Creek Reservoir. Um, we need to replace the spillway to meet uh, Virginia uh, dam safety standards. Um, and in the process, uh, we are going to replace the raw water pump station, the intake, and the pipe to the Crozet water treatment plant. Completion should be 2025 to 2027 um, with a budget of $32 million. And we are, we are requesting federal funding, uh, hopefully up to 65%, to cover up to 65% of the project. Um, just, for, just for reference, the current raw water pump station, which is pictured here, which is again at the bottom of the dam, um, currently it's going to move to a site um, on the reservoir, uh, on the reservoir, and um, we're going to upgrade the pipe, which brings the, the water to the treatment plant. And 
What you can see here is a labyrinth spillway. And the next slide, it's a, we're gonna install a four cycle labyrinth spillway through the embankment. So it's, if we can picture, um, this is Brown's Gap Turnpike this way. And there's gonna be a detour road on the upstream side of the dam during construction. Uh, the new pump station will be built on the south side of the reservoir on the first peninsula upstream from the dam. And there will be a hypolimnetic oxygenation system uh, to increase um, oxygen mixing and improve the water quality in the reservoir as part of this project. And so we talk a little bit about reservoir operations. Those of you that are familiar with Beaver Creek Reservoir, um, we, um, we have 499 million gallons of water um, stored in Beaver Creek Reservoir, our average day demand in Crozet is uh, 0.6 million gallons a day. Um, yeah, so we have um, community water demand ranges from 0.5 to 1.1. That was last year in 2021. So we have about seven months of storage uh, with no additional inflow. So we have uh, Beaver Creek and Parrot Branch feed the reservoir at these two fingers here. So. Again, if we'd had no additional inflow, we'd have approximately seven months of storage in the reservoir. Um, we do treat the reservoir uh, in the warmer months with algicide. It's something that happened uh, this week. I wanna say this week. Um, yeah, it did happen on Tuesday. Um, we monitor the reservoir with uh, weekly samples that are collected at uh, sample points. We have two buoys actually. If you see these little two little white buoys, one is down here by the by the dam and one is upstream here uh, by the confluence of the two fingers where we can keep an eye on what's coming in. Uh, we evaluate, we collect the samples, we do algae counts and we have, we've established thresholds and procedures. Um, we have a licensed algicide applicator that comes in and treats the reservoir. Um, we do have staff on site during the treatments and um, what we're using, the chemicals that we're using are approved for drinking water applications and we're using them at a fraction of the approved doses. So it's an effective program. And um, there's a link down here at the bottom, which you can provide a little more information if anyone wanted to, uh, to learn more about what we do um, with Beaver Creek Reservoir. And that's it for me now. Does anyone have any questions? Do you want me to stop sharing? Is that what's most effective? Uh, yeah, probably at this point, Dave. Was, was there further updates um, about the, the dam or that? Um, that's what you had. That's, that's what I have. Uh, Victoria, do you have any further updates on, on where we are with the dam process or the, the funding? Yeah, absolutely. So right now we're about two years into a planning process, um, it, which is fully funded by the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And what that entails is basically a, a look at various alternatives for upgrading the dam spillway and then an environmental assessment of the impacts of all the different uh, alternative uh, alternatives for the spillway. So we're, we've got a selected alternative. We had a public meeting several months ago, and now we're kind of in the regulatory review phase of that process. And there would be, there will be a draft report that will go out for public comment sometime, probably late summer or early fall. And we expect that process to conclude sometime around the end of the year, at which point we'll move then into the design phase, which will be about a year and a half to two years before we can go then into construction. Victoria, have you, have we, does everyone fully understand why we're doing this project? Uh, Victoria can provide some more details on why this is happening. And, and, and of course the price tag can be sort of staggering. Does everyone, does anyone want to know yeah. that? Yeah, Dave, I think that would be helpful. We, we do have a few. Yeah. Oh. I think, it, I think it would be helpful to have a, a little bit of background. So we do have some new folks joining us. Sure. So the dam was built uh, from, I think, 1961 to 1963. And when it was designed, it was built as what we call now a significant hazard dam. So there's low, significant, and high hazard. And what that means essentially is if the dam were to fail, um, the consequences downstream would range from low to high. Um, so it was designed as a significant hazard dam, which meant it would probably flood some downstream roadways, um, maybe some structures, but it wouldn't likely cause 
loss of life. Now, you know, 50 years later, um, regulations have changed and also downstream development has occurred, which means that if that dam were to fail, there would likely be loss of life due to the overtopping of downstream roads and then the flooding of structures. I think there's maybe 13 residential structures downstream in the inundation area for the dam. So that dam was upgraded in, I wanna say 2012 to a high hazard structure, which means that it needs to be built to a higher standard with a larger spillway and the ability to pass more water during an extreme flood event. So we're going from a flood where it might have had to pass, you know, 15 to 20 inches of rain in 24 hours. Now it needs to pass over 30 inches of rain in 24 hours, which is obviously a huge storm. So the, the spillway capacity is, is the regulatory piece that we're dealing with. And then the, the pump station and the raw water pump up, pumping upgrades, um, those are, sort of tied to the dam project because we'll be modifying a lot about the structure and affecting the location of the pump station, but also um, you know, due to growing demand in the Crozet area and the need to continue to uh, send water downstream in addition to serving the community's water supply needs, uh, we kind of have to reconfigure how the pump station is set up fundamentally in order to serve both of those functions, both the, the human need for water and the environmental need to keep water in the stream. So that that's that component of the project. And then as Dave mentioned, with the raw water pump station, we're installing the hypolinetic oxygenation system, which is essentially just a bubbler underwater that provides oxygen to, um, I think it deters algal growth. I won't I'm not a biologist, so I won't uh, pretend to know all the science behind it, but um, it, it should lessen the need for algal treatments and um, should improve water quality um, while we're increasing our capacity as well. Victor, do you want to talk briefly about how the storm event changed, how the total the total storm event, you, we, you mentioned some inches and does everyone understand, that wasn't our doing. Right, we were we were no. changed change for us. No, it, those are tied to it's called your spillway design flood. So your, your spillway design has to match the risk of failure. So, like I said, it was designed as a significant hazard dam, which meant it didn't have to have as big of a spillway because if the dam were to fail, it wouldn't likely have caused any loss of life. Now that's not the case. So we need to be able to handle a bigger storm in order to to prevent that loss of life or massive economic impacts to the downstream areas. So um, to give it some context, I'm trying to think of a, a low hazard dam in our area. Um, the the Toadier Creek Dam down in Scottsville, for example, is a low hazard dam. And what that means is if that dam fails, it might flood a little bit of farmland and then it goes into the James River and most of that water attenuates. There's no loss of life. There's no major economic damage. So the spillway can be very small. It doesn't need to hold back as much water as a dam that can cause more massive um, consequences if it were to fail. So the, the difference was not anything fundamentally about the safety of the structure. It's more about what was built downstream and our need to protect those downstream areas from, a, from flooding. We talk about these rainfall events, and I know in the, in, in the mid '90s there was a significant rainfall event in Sugar Hollow. At the top of my head, I don't remember it, but um, Victoria's our dam engineer, so she probably remembers how many inches of rain came in '94. Was it? Was it 24 inches in 24 hours? Yeah, it was. I think it was in 1995. It was. I, I don't know off the top of my head. I should know these numbers, but yeah, it was over 20 inches of rain in a, in a overnight period. So these these events which we call the probable maximum flood they're very rare um I, I think there's only been maybe one or two times in the entire united states in recorded history that we've seen a flood the magnitude of a pmf but they can happen and we've seen you know with hurricane harvey in texas um we've seen with floods in, you know hurricane camille in the 60s in nelson county and um and the flood in 1995 the sugar hollow we can see huge rain events and so we need to be prepared for those um, just in case they happen. And with climate change, who knows? Great, Dave, Victoria, thank you very much. Uh, we will take questions first from the committee and then if there's any other attendees from the public who'd like to ask questions. I, I have a few, uh, I'll try to take it in order, but if anybody else has questions, please jump in. The first one actually goes, Victoria, um, the question about the dam, the one uh, we've been hearing great updates on this, you know, for a couple of years now. And the question that always comes up is, uh, is the road. Uh, and closing the road and rerouting the road. Uh, what's the latest thinking there on the viability of a 
Uh, I, I think there was talk at one time about rerouting a road so that you don't have to close it. What, where are we with that? Yeah, so I don't know, Dave, if you can easily share the presentation again. There's a slide that shows our preferred alternative and also the, the proposed detour route. So if there was a point where we were weighing different options for a detour or the potential for closing the road during construction. Um, you know, obviously that there's some concerns with closing the road. There's some farms that require use of Browns Gap Turnpike in order to get their products out. Um, there's also, you know, folks on the other side that would um, potentially have their, their access to emergency services like fire rescue um, impacted by long detours um, and just general concern about, um, you know, school buses and lengthening people's commutes. So we, we initially looked at a detour and if you guys are familiar with the area, so this is Browns Gap Turnpike headed north over the dam, or I'm sorry, this is the road here. This is the little parking area that's in between the spillway and the dam. And then the old road used to go down to the, the toe of the dam down here, and that's where the pump station is currently located. And then we actually have a, an access road to our pump station that goes along the old road alignment. So initially we thought about using the old roadbed as a detour route, but what that would mean is we would have to reestablish a bridge over Beaver Creek. It would be immediately downstream of the pump station, which would have to stay in service for a portion of the construction. Um, it also, we saw some pretty steep grades on the south leg of that, um, going basically from, from Browns Gap down the hill towards the dam. So we, we were concerned about safety with school buses and um, traffic during the winter. So we reevaluated and we came up with this alternative to put a detour on the upstream side. So on the lake side of the dam, and they'll have to probably um, put in sheet piles or some sort of coffer dam in order to um, build up that area to put in a temporary road, but that would be put in place for a portion of the project while the spillway is being constructed. And then once the bridge is installed over the spillway, then we could move the road back to its existing alignment, um, demolish the, the detour route and be kind of business as usual while we button up the rest of the project. Okay, thank you very much, Victoria. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, hopefully good news to a lot of people in that area. Um, the other questions that I had just had to do with um, uh, water supply and resilience. Um, Dave, I know you mentioned you talked about the, you know, the 499 million gallons in the reservoir there and the supply. Um, I believe lots of lawyer was here uh, and talked about the pipeline project that's, that's going to make water available from whatever it is, the, the sort of north end reservoir uh, and connecting down to Ragged Mountain um, to allow piping water back and forth. I, I believe that was partly uh, that was partly intended to be a resilience to allow you know water if there are issues. Uh, I'm wondering what you know what is Crozet's backup plan? What, what kind of resilience do we have if uh, you know if a tornado takes out the water treatment plant? What do what do Crozations do? Um, well, we have you know we will have before we shut down at night or we we do have half a million gallons of water in the ground storage tank. So that's the tank on the treatment plant site. We have 2 million gallons up on Buck Mountain. So we have some time. Um, uh, I think in our, in, in our, um, the, the, the extended plan would, would, would probably involve some temporary piping from the Ivy area, Owensville Road and bringing water bringing bringing water west if there was some permanent damage that was done um okay. that that would be that would be the, the plan for that and and the um the, the, the pipeline connecting the two the two reservoirs those connect south of van and ragged mountain i can speak to that a little bit too dave oh, yeah. if you'd like so um we did a, a study called the drinking water infrastructure plan or we'll refer to it as the dwip in our organization um, so the, the drinking water infrastructure plan basically looked at uh, the facilities that we have in Crozet, what our long range water supply needs are going to be from the community and tried to make sure that those are going to match up over the long run. So that's what we use to inform our upgrades at the water treatment plant. 
That's what we used to determine whether or not we needed to increase the reservoir size when we upgraded the spillway at Beaver Creek, which we have determined we don't. Um, and that's what we use to size pumps for the raw water pump station and determine kind of how that, that new raw water pump station is gonna need to be set up. And during that study, we also looked at some other alternatives for providing water supply to the Crozet area, um, which included everything from using, I think, um, pump piped water from, I wanna say Mint Springs was one option we looked at. We looked at bringing water from Ivy from our urban area. We looked at piping water from Sugar Hollow down to the Beaver Creek Reservoir. Um, we looked at building a, a totally new reservoir. And most of those options were, were pretty not cost effective as compared to upgrading the dam, um, upgrading our pumping facilities and upgrading the treatment plant. So, um, you know, most water uh, utilities of this size don't have redundant plants. So as Dave mentioned, in the absolute catastrophic case, you know, we'd have to mobilize resources in the short run and then and then make repairs as quickly as possible. But generally speaking, we've found that for at least a 50 year planning horizon, we have plenty of water in Beaver Creek and our facilities can be built up to, um, to pump the water to the plant and to treat the water and distribute it to the, the finished water system. Wonderful, thank you, Victoria. I know I think one thing uh, the committee always enjoys is the long-term planning horizon. We, I know I always enjoy hearing that, that you, know, you guys are looking 50 years ahead. Uh, it's very reassuring um, for those of us who live in the area. I guess I just had one other quick question and Victoria, this might be for you because it goes back to the dam. When you talked about um, the, the or, or maybe it's a date question, I'm not sure. The, the funding, the federal funding for the dam, um, the possibility of that, is that, is that baked into the current sort of budgeting and planning process, the sort of banking on getting that federal funding, or would that be essentially icing on the cake and that would be a great thing to happen and, and would maybe forestall rate increases or something? So for the funding would come through uh, the US Department of Agriculture um, and it's never guaranteed until you submit an application and you get the money in hand. So the way that we plan for the project is we kind of have two pathways we plan for the worst case scenario. And so we budget in our CIP for receiving no further federal funding beyond the planning phase. Sometime this summer to fall, as we're wrapping up the, the planning phase of the dam project, and we're gonna be requesting funding for the next phase, which is design. And then once we conclude design, then we can request funding for construction. Um, we're hopeful that we will get the funding. Um, as Dave mentioned, it would cover up to 65% of project costs um, for at least the dam and could potentially cover a portion of the raw water pump station project as well, which is pretty significant. Um, so, you know, your guess is as good as mine if the feds will continue to put money in the farm bill for this program um, and, and whether we'll be eligible for it but completing each subsequent phase of the project, so planning and then design, does make it more likely that once you get to construction, the funding would be available for that. Did I answer that question? Okay. I, th I, think that, I think you did. The, the, the current CIP planning is predicated on not yeah. receiving any federal funds. That's, that's right. Yeah, that was, that was essentially it. Um, Lonnie, I see you have a question. Our new planning fisherman. Yes. Um, have you considered the long-term impacts of upstream development and um, and, and how is the county really looking at protecting the, the buffer, stream buffers and other things that could cause sedimentation of the reservoir? I know that that's been a problem in some of our other reservoirs of loss of capacity due to sedimentation. Dave, I don't know if you want to take yeah. that. Yeah, we don't really see much sedimentation um, at, at Beaver Creek. Um, the issues that we see at Beaver Creek, we think are, are legacy nutrients that are locked in the sediment at the bottom of the reservoir. You know, there's a large agricultural history, particularly orchards in that area um, upstream in the watershed. And so um, we don't see much mud. We, don't, we call it mud in our, and it, uh, when it rains real heavy, you don't really see it turn brown or you know, look like chocolate milk. Um, but we do see at times, we'll see some nutrients that wash in either um, from farm fields upstream. Uh, we've done some work with local cattle farmers to keep their cows out of the parrot branch and out of the uh, Beaver Creek tributary. Um, we posted signs and we've talked to that uh, that landowner just keeping the cows out of the reservoir. 
is, is, is a huge thing for us. Um, I don't think north of 240 is in the is in the development area of Crozet. So right now, I think it's it, there's aren't I don't think there might be one subdivision north of um, um, kind of north of Star Hill there. Um, but there's a vet, and then there's a new car wash there. So the actual the Beaver Creek watershed is 240. Anything that falls north goes to Beaver Creek. Anything that falls south goes to Licking Hole Creek. Um, so there isn't much development that I know of in the Beaver Creek uh, watershed. Does that answer your question, Lonnie? Yes, it, it does. I know that there is one um, pending development that's that's going to be along um, Parrot Branch. It's under review. Yeah, right now the Crozet Elementary School is under construction. Um, I've been by there a million times and see the silt fences, but that is right on the Parrot Branch and. Um, that's a rather big develop, rather big project, and it's got a lot of ground disturbed, and and I haven't seen any impacts to that on the reservoir myself. Um, we do just just to come full circle though, we do talk to Dominion. Dominion has a large transmission line that crosses Beaver Creek Reservoir. It might be in one of those pictures on the um, up by the Parrot Branch, uh, um, and we have talked to Dominion. Hey, because I do do um, uh, vegetation control underneath their. Um, transmission mains, transmission lines. And we've talked to them about, you know, staying 200 feet off the reservoir with their, with their, um, with their uh, herb herbicides and whatnot. And they've been compliant with that also, um, just, just as an FYI. Thank you very much, Dave. And thank you, Lonnie, for that question. Any other questions from the committee? Yes. <clears throat> Joe, you asked a good question about resiliency. And Dave or Victoria, my question is about any planned resiliency for the wastewater side of the system? Um, what are the consequences of uh, another extended power failure like uh, the kind we had after the 2012 derecho? <laughs> well, you should talk about that because I was I was 30 days into my position here in the derecho oh, boy. Hit, and uh, the water side was uh, Crozet. We were actually carrying five gallon gas cans of diesel fuel down the dam to keep the raw pump station generator running because the access road was covered in dead trees and down trees. So first and foremost, there is, um, we have backup generators at all of our Crozet pump stations. Uh, we regularly maintain, um, we regularly maintain and operate the pumps. So the pumps cycle off and on. We do maintenance on those daily and weekly. And one thing we, we pride ourselves in, and, and a lot of people talk about, well, I have a generator. I'm good, I have a generator. Now the generator is not worth a dog on if you don't run it under load. So we run all our generators under load every single month. It'd be like leaving your car in the garage and, and turning it on and shutting it off after 10 minutes and say, I'm good, I can drive to Illinois. No, you need to put it in drive, you need to drive 80 miles an hour down 64. So we do that, and that's important. Uh, we have a regular operation and maintenance program uh, with the generators we bring in. We bring in, we have service contracts with those generators. But Ken, to answer your question, there are readily available um, wastewater treatment, wastewater pumps. So if our system went down, there are diesel powered pumps that you can rent and that you would just connect up into the force main system. And I say just connect up, it's not as easy as it sounds, but it, it could be. Um, so we do have the ability to do that. They come out of Richmond. We have service contracts with these folks to come and help us with that. There is some storage in the system itself. It's not a lot, but there is some storage in the system. Um, the unique part of Crozet is, you know, we pump from one to the next, to the next, to the next. It's in sequence. So we have had an issue before where we had to um, move. We would pump one wet well down and then run the next one to pump it down and, and, and do that. Um, so it, it can be a challenge, you know, you, 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 um, you balance the likelihood of the, of the occurrence to the cost of the occurrence. And so I like to think we're prepared for, for almost anything that comes down the pike, but that's, you know, um, that, that's what we do. Just to add to that. So Dave mentioned we can deploy temporary pumps to all those facilities. I think in the last couple of years, we actually added external pipe connections so that we can do that more easily instead of having to pump out of the, the, the wet wells and then back into the system, we actually have 
like hookup connections that we installed recently. And then the FET is huge for that resiliency. If we had something go down, we have a million gallons of storage on the, the farthest west end of the wastewater system, wastewater force main system that can hold wastewater until we can get the pumps back up and running to get things moving again. Thank you very much, David Victoria. We have about five more minutes on this topic, so we'll go to Costas, and then uh, we'll go to Vice uh, We have a hand up in, uh, in one of our attendees. Uh, so we'll go to Costas, and then we'll go to our attendees. Thank you. Um, one of the things you said about increasing capacity, is there any thought, are you raising water level at all, or is that maintaining and staying the same? The plan right now is not to raise the water level at the Beaver Creek Dam. We've found through our drinking water infrastructure planning that we have sufficient storage. And then by building a new pump station, we can more carefully dial in how much water is going to the plant and how much water is going into the stream. So we can keep, you know, the DQ and all those and fish and wildlife folks happy by putting enough water in the stream and still make sure that in the drought of record, we could provide enough water to the community as well. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. I see that we have uh, Matt has a hand up. Could we uh, unmute Matt? Matt, thank you for your patience. Please uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hey, I got a couple of questions. Uh, probably the first one being the most important. Um, as Curzay has grown, we have lacked recreation opportunities. And as you all know, Beaver Creek has been um, really important to the community. Can you speak about improvements to recreation and recreation access that could happen at Beaver Creek with this project? So uh, we have been in communication with um, Parks and Recreation Department at Albemarle County um, and also with the, the Beaver Creek Sculling and Western Albemarle Rowing Club. And so, um, you know, I don't know that we've, we've had a lot of discussions about improvements to those facilities, but we've talked about maintaining access to those facilities during construction. Um, one big focus that we had in our, um, our alternatives discussion for the Beaver Creek Dam spillway upgrades was not impacting additional park area by building a spillway through the existing spillway. So as you saw, we're gonna have this big concrete spillway and we opted to put it through the dam embankment instead of in the existing spillway, which is uh, on the other side of that little parking lot. And so what that means is we're basically preserving all that grassy area that's there for future use as a park. and. Um, by building a new spillway adjacent to that, we actually are gonna fill in the existing spillway without the exhibit up, I'm sorry that I'm maybe not describing things clearly, but, but the spillway is essentially where the road dips down a little bit and that's for emergency water passage. So when we put build a new spillway through the dam, that area will get built up to the level of the road or to the top of dam. And then it's no longer a spillway, which means it could be used for construction of new park facilities. Whereas now you can't park in it long-term, you can't put um, you know, jungle gyms, you can't put um, any buildings or anything in it because it needs to remain open as a spillway. So there, it does create opportunities for expansion of the park areas into that area, or at least continuation of that as a, a nice grassy park area. Okay, thank you. Um, I would I would highly encourage you all to continue to look at ways to um, embed recreation access in the project, especially if we're competing for federal funds. Um, and not only could it help us improve the um, viability of our application, but it would be very important to the community here. Um, so the other thing, kind of a hybrid question, um, RWSA, RWSA stole our land to put the sewer main from um, Curzay School to the wastewater treatment plant. And I personally have found the relationship between RWSA and my parents to be acrimonious. And I really hope that um, you all can do a better job of outreaching to the people whose land you stole to build this infrastructure. Um, and uh, so I, I hope that, that something changes there. And then upstream, you know, we own the property on the unnamed creek, which hopefully the county will get their act together and name Crozet Creek and Parrot Branch. So we own the part of the peninsula between those two. Um, and there is a lot of uh, contamination upstream. We've been fighting with the county to, you know, the the um, the filter station at the Dairy Queen. That's been it's been years since it's been inspected. It's not working properly. Um, the you know th there's a, there's a ton of, of runoff from fil uh, from lawn fertilizers. Um, and I, I hope that you all can take that contamination a little bit more seriously. We've 
we've had numerous um, spills that have directly impacted our property, which flows straight into Beaver Creek. And so I hope y'all take that a little bit more seriously and work with um, the people here to get off of um, septic systems and onto the sewer system. And then, you know, communicating better ways to manage landscapes than just putting lawn fertilizer down. Thank you, Matt, for your comments and questions. Uh, Lonnie, final word to you. Yeah, this is just directed to Matt. I just want to point out that there is, um, with my other hat, um, as a director on the Stormwater Conservation District, there are incentive programs to do things like convert lawn to native plants, to put in rain gardens and biofilters, um, fence cattle out of streams. And, and I really hope that um, the community can help promote those programs and take advantage of them to, to help um, keep that water clean. Thank you very much, Lonnie. And thank you to Dave and Victoria. It's always a pleasure uh, having sat through a, a number of meetings for years. Uh, it's always great to have the Rivanna Water Service Authority join us. Um, again, you know, what you all do for our community uh, is, uh, is an incredibly valuable service to make sure that we have water, not only for our current use, but for decades to come. So thank you all for joining us and uh, keeping us informed uh, about what's going on. Great, thanks for having us. Thank you. All right, we continue with our water theme. It's a water world tonight. Uh, that was no accident, but I thought there would be a, a fun water theme here. It's all water. Um, so next we will be hearing from our, our county engineer about uh, the water protection ordinance. So uh, we will turn it over right now. Frank? Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. You're welcome. Um, so what I'm going to do is share this um, exhibit or um, of the project, and I'm going to open this up for questions. I can find it here. So I think everybody's familiar with this project. Um, it's been written up in the Crozet Gazette. And um, so I'm really here to answer questions that you may have regarding the, the ordinance. I can outline um, you know, when, when our jurisdiction comes into play, it's 10,000 square feet of land disturbance. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to open it up for any questions you have. Sure, and just for context for those of us, uh, our, our newer members and, and maybe members of the public who are joining, I believe we're talking about, this is the, the White Gate Farm property, Frank, that you have up here. Um, uh, the proposal, the Montclair, I believe is the name of the, the project. Yeah, it's had, it's had a few names, um, Western Ridge, Montclair, um, yeah. And so, so for those people who may recall several months ago, there, there was some, some dispute, there's, there's um, Development obviously has been proposed on this property, and um, Frank, please step in if I'm if I'm mischaracterizing, getting this wrong. There, there is a, a stream portion that runs through the the southern portion of the property, and there has been some dispute or debate about how far northward and westward that stream extends. Um, and, and I think, um, I guess, Frank, I'll, I'll sort of just maybe throw out the question. I think some of us, or some people who attended meetings, and some members of the committee. Um, we're just curious to know sort of how the process works in terms of between you and the Army Corps in actually determining where and what a stream is. I think, you know, we, we heard from some members of the community who drove by there and they brought pictures. They said, look, you've got, you know, there's a clear, there's flowing water and there's mature trees and uh, that sure looks like a stream. And yet the, you know, the uh, map is saying that that's not actually a stream. So maybe you could just walk us through a little bit of Sort of stream delineation. How do we go about determining what counts as a stream and what doesn't? Um, and maybe specifically how that process played out in this project. Sure. So we start with the USGS maps, um, which I have right here. And I may have to change my screen. Um, to show this, we start with USGS mapping for all streams in the county. Uh, the USGS map has um, 
intermittent and perennial streams shown. I think I had it up here. This is the storm event that Victoria was talking about earlier. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, all right, I'll have to pull it up again. It's real easy to find. USGS stream. So anybody can look this up on the USGS map. And um, this is just a starting point for us when, uh, and this is what we based our maps on. So the, if you go to our, the county GIS, we kind of mimic this map. And we've done some changes to it. We've added some streams to it. We've um, reclassified a few from, since I've been here, I've been in, at the county as county engineer for um, approximately about six years. And I'm trying to find this area. Can you all see my the, the map, Joe? Okay. Yeah, it's up. We can see it. And uh, here's Park Ridge. And so when we we start, we look at these maps, and and as you can see here, this this map shows the stream. Coming under the railroad, it's, an, it's dashed, it's intermittent. We know there's still a buffer on this stream because it drains to a drinking water watershed. And then it stops here. So um, there was a question about this and the Corps got involved and the Corps went out. This is Vinnie Perot and he determined that based on the flow that the stream continued up. It took a left through the woods there, as, as you know, and then it went up to 240 where there's a culvert that crosses under 240 from this farm on the north side. And we don't really know where the water source is here. It it's, uh, could be groundwater, it could be this marshy area on the other side of the road, could be a combination of groundwater um, coming from this side of the road. And then it discharges to a pipe at this location. Let's see if I've got that shown here. What's interesting is, well, not interesting, but, um, This is the location. I'll turn on our maps layer or um, buffer layer and contours. And so that's kind of how we determine streams. We have we have field investigations where Vinny got involved and went out to the site. And beyond what was shown on the map, the uh, USGS map, he said, I consider this a stream. He doesn't determine if it's perennial or intermittent. He just determines if it's a stream. If it's intermittent or perennial though, he does say it's a stream. So those are his, so those streams are classified as streams by the state. In other words, he won't do the, he won't make a difference between those two, but it didn't matter in this case because intermittent has a buffer here. Also, we use the difference to decide when a buffer is required in the development area for an intermittent stream or a perennial stream because buffers are not required as some of you may know in the development areas. This is not in a development area, but intermittent streams in rural areas are still required to have a buffer if they are draining to a drinking water watershed. Mark, you have a question? Yeah, so uh, I wanna make sure I understand. So um, the, that river was taken off the map Someone from the Corps of Engineers made a comment that the stream didn't exist. And now the Corps of Engineers has retracted that and gone back and said, yes, there's a stream that goes, as you explained, all the way up to 240, underneath 240 through culvert. Is that correct? I can't speak to what you just said in terms of how that occurred. What I can tell you is that the Corps ultimately determined that there was a stream there. And... Uh, that was his determination. I don't know about the first part, okay. whether or not no, they, they changed their mind or, or whatnot. That, so, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I wanted to bring this up also, the um, aerial. Uh, and this Lonnie, is the condition of the site. Oh. Is there another question? I'm sorry. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, Frank, please go ahead. If you, if you were explaining something, then we'll, and then we'll go to Lonnie after you explain what you wanted to show. Uh, let's go. Go ahead, Lonnie. You can jump in here. 
Yes, um, my, my question comment won't be a surprise to you. Um, in 2014, our water protection ordinance was changed from one that required perpetual buffers to one that was linked to the 10,000 square feet of disturbance, which, which really is part of the loophole that was exploited here. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the county's plan to go back to the previous standard pre-2014 and adopt a stream protection overlay district? Yeah, so um, what Lonnie's saying is, is the current ordinance, um, this is our ordinance for buffers, 17600. And it starts with, except as provided in 602, each erosion and sediment control plan and each VSMP permit shall provide for stream buffers. So that statement right there is saying that the buffer is contingent upon you having one of these types of plans. And if you're exempt from our ordinance, then you don't need one of these plans and therefore the buffer does not apply. So um, I wasn't here when the ordinance was changed, but we're working on creating an overlay district and we're, we're still thinking about this Lonnie as being in an overlay district. And I appreciate your comments about the stigma maybe associated with that. Um, but we're hoping to, we're planning to, or we're, we're working on an overlay district um, to create a zoning layer, to take it out of the water protection ordinance and basically create a zoning layer that defines streams um, without this threshold of land, distur land disturbance. So there wouldn't be a lower threshold for land disturbance. It would apply to every stream in the county. There would still be exemptions and you know, like far farming is an exemption right now for stream buffers. Um, forestry um, is, an ex is, a, is exempt with conditions that you maintain a 50 foot buffer and maintain 50% of the, the basal area, meaning you can cut 50% of the trees out of that buffer, but you still have to maintain 50% of the trees that are in that 50 foot. So it's a little different than the 100 foot for development. Um, but that's another requirement, for instance, for forestry. So there will still be, and we're, we're not proposing at this point to change any of, the, any of those exemptions, except to um, clarify um, what is and what isn't allowed within buffers. I think maybe one of the things that would probably, uh, the big change is the threshold goes away. And that's the intent here is to create a buffer that is on the ground and it's based on definitions. It's not gonna be based on a map is our thought at this point. Okay, this is, this is not set in stone and there's gonna be public hearings about this. So everybody will have a chance to speak about it once, this, um, once we kind of get the, the, the draft um, ready. Um, so the lower threshold would go away and then also we would extend buffers over the waters. Right now, the jurisdiction of the buffer starts at the top of bank or at the edge of a wetland, for instance, and it goes 100 feet beyond that. It doesn't extend over the waterways. So we want to, uh, we want to do that also. So that would then potentially prohibit or um, keep somebody from doing any piping, for instance, even 200 feet or 100 feet of, it, of a stream. So that's what we're working on right now. And the board has approved that and asked us to move forward with that. And we're looking to, to come to the, to the board and I think it's August to give an update um, on where we are in all of this. So Lonnie, I think that summarizes what you asked about, is that? Yes, correct. Um, and, and I think also an important piece of this is bringing the county in, in greater alliance, uh, sorry, a greater um, alignments with the um, Chesapeake Bay Act. Yeah, and the Chesapeake Bay Act, uh, a lot of the communities, we looked at a lot of their ordinances and they do have it in the, the zoning ordinance, this overlay. Um, some have maps, some have um, text that they use. We wanna go with a text version so that it's based on what's on the ground. 
and based on determination because maps, um, we can't go out and do a, a determination on every stream in the county. So we wanna be able to do those determinations and make adjustments uh, based on the core. We can't call a stream that the core doesn't call a stream, for instance. So we would still rely on the core and, and DEQ also. Mallory, you have your hand up. Hi, yes. Um, so I just, this is a clarifying question. Um, so I, I'm curious to know what, what, what data um, does the, the county use that's authoritative to define a stream? So, um, right, to start this off, you showed a, an ArcGIS map that does not show the stream going out to 240. Um, I, I've seen images of like the current county tax map and also the Cozy Master Plan as of August 2021 um, that does show the, the stream going out to 240. Um, and then you also mentioned you know, that the Army Corps of Engineers says that it is indeed a stream um, going out to 240. So I'm just curious to know what, what data uh, is, is used to define a stream from the county planning perspective. And in this case, um, for the Montfair project, um, does the WPO apply and will the county enforce it um, all the way out to 240? So here's how we um, define streams. It's in our ordinance under definitions. Perennial stream is a stream depicted on a continu as a continu the perennial is a continuous blue line in the map that I just showed you. Um, so on this map, you'll see here, um, these are dashed, but when you get down here to Licking Hole Creek, it's a continuous blue line. That's a perennial stream. Okay, so there's further definition though here that um, speaks to delineated as perennial by the core, for instance. So the core can, perennial, I don't think we, we really don't see a lot of questions about what's perennial in the county. Um, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, what are perennial streams? It's really the difference uh, when it's between intermittent and perennial. Um, and when we talk about intermittent, there's also a definition for intermittent. I can find it here. If I knew my, my um, alphabet, I could find it easier. Let me see. <laughs> intermittent, there we go. So it's a natural stream. And this is a distinction also um, for buffers currently. And Lonnie's made a point to this in the past, on, on a uh, call last week that you know, our, buff, our ordinance is based on natural streams, not pipe streams. So we could, somebody's echoing. Um, we could expand our definition or buffers to include pipe streams. The core doesn't distinguish. They would still call that pipe stream a stream. Um, and they do, is my understanding. So for instance, when you have roads that cross over a stream or you you, you um, box culvert a portion of the stream like um, old trail drive that's a box culvert that's still a stream that's going through that box culvert um, so i think that you know that's a point that we might need to address in terms of natural versus um, pipe streams also um, to the second part of your question about the stream that's out there it it has not it is no longer being classified as a stream by the core in terms of um, that one section is being classified, but doesn't meet our definition as a stream. Um, so let me bring up that exhibit again. So segment one was piped and that resulted in about 6,000 square feet of land disturbance. Our threshold for land disturbance is 10,000. So it did not trigger a ENS plan or a VSMP plan, Virginia Stormwater Management Plan. And when this was piped, it connected to what was already piped. This is already piped from over 50 years ago. I went back through the, the uh, aerials and photography and I, I couldn't really figure out the exact date, but it's it's been, this has been here for quite a long time. This over here, it was hard to tell, but this looks like it was, was a farm. It was. Anyway, so I couldn't, I couldn't pinpoint the date, but um, this is now a pipe stream. So they connected 
from that culvert that came out from under 240 to a manhole structure here and uh, to this pipe stream. This pipe stream then goes to a manhole structure that's located in the stormwater management facility and then outlets down here in the bottom right. This portion, segment two and three, was um, from the from what I recall, well, what, from what the, the, um, the core said is that this, the water was no, there was no longer any water serving that portion of the stream. Therefore, they're not calling it a stream any further. So um, this portion was not shown on USGS. I think the USGS terminates approximately in this location on the USGS map. And based on our ordinance, it's based on what is designated now in the field. It's not what was designated by the Corps a year ago or six months ago. They granted a permit to pipe this. And as a base or as a result of that, they no longer classify this as a stream. The streams are waters of the state. So they're not county um, features. I know we may we treat them as county. We like streams and we want, they are in the county, but they're not regulated by the county. They're regulated by the core, which is why our ordinance to date starts with buffers at the top of bank. And the core regulates everything to the mean water level. Everything above that is out of their jurisdiction. So the Rivanna, they, you go look at the edge of the Rivanna, there's, there's plants along the side that will tell you you can see where um, you can help figure out based on the plants where that mean water level is. And they use that to determine where their jurisdiction stops. It's not just them, it's DEQ and it's the Game and Fish. They all have jurisdiction at that level down. Um, the county jurisdiction starts on the land above that. So if the core issues a permit, and I got involved with the core with the, I got the core, excuse me, the uh, DEQ involved with this. Um, they said we cannot interfere with their permits. Um, and I don't know if we're, we're proposing we'll do that, but I think we have the right as a, a community through our zoning ordinance to propose and overlay additional restrictions on things such as the waterway. Um, and they would still have to go through our, the county to, 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 you know, for future impacts if they're, if this gets passed. Um, so we can have overlaying, overlying jurisdiction, but we don't have that at this time. So, um, so that's kind of, uh, I think I answered your question on that, but if, if I haven't, please let me know. Yeah, thank you. You, you covered a lot there. Um, I, I just want to point out, um, I, I've sort of briefly, a couple of weeks ago, read through the WPO and, you know, I keep on hearing that um, it, there needed to be, or as long as there was a minimum of 10,000 square feet of land disturbed, then the WPO did not trigger. Um, however, in, in my understanding of reading the WPO, there are multiple caveats um, that would trigger uh, the WPO to apply one of those being um, if if this the um, if there's a common plan of development linked to uh, the piping, and so I'm just curious, you know, why is there so much focus on on just one piece of the WPO when there are multiple caveats that are uh, detailed um, that would trigger um, you know, some form of, of protection of, of the stream before the piping would have been allowed. Sure. Um, there is no common plan for this property yet. If there is a rezoning, then there will be a common plan. The, the, um, the uh, rezoning does not, the current rezoning being that it's in the, and I've, been, I've gone through our attorneys on this, um, does not restrict the rights of the property owner at this time until that rezoning is approved. Um, so there is no common plan at this time. A common plan is something that occurs over part, like, like Old Trail, where they have a thousand acres, it could be 20 acres like this project, 
or however many acres this project is. But once it's approved, then you have uh, the potential for different activities on different parcels. We're trying to address incremental development. This wouldn't have applied here, um, possibly. I need to think about that. Um, where incremental development on a single parcel versus in a common plan, common plan um, involves something that the way we've always interpreted this is when you have a larger development that subdivides the parcels and then you have different operators operating within that common plan. Um, on a single parcel, it it is not a common plan on a single parcel. So we're trying to close that loophole and and to for us that's an that's an incremental development so if you have somebody that does nine thousand square feet of land disturbance one year and then they stabilize it the next year they come out and they do another nine thousand and stabilize it our ordinance we don't think addresses that um, because land disturbance is based on the current condition if you um, look at that or you look into the deq language it's based on the current condition of the land or proposed condition but if somebody's not proposing anything um, in terms of an, an approved site plan for instance then there's not a common plan they would have to have a phased plan um, for that to meet a common plan definition i'm, I'm confused at at um i guess the just the, the Montfair development proposal was submitted before the piping occurred. So I'm just, I'm confused why it doesn't count as a common plan of development. Um, like it, it, it seems pretty clear to me that the purpose for the piping of the stream is to enable uh, that property to, to be development under the proposal that uh, was submitted for the Montfair um development so I, i'm just i don't understand um i guess the the official way that a a common plan of development uh gets uh, approved again i just it's not it doesn't become a common plan until that plan is approved because it could be denied or they could withdraw it the landowner i've been told again through the county attorney's office that until that plan is approved, those requirements for that plan do not apply to that project because the current landowner still has rights under their current land use. That, that, that rezoning is only a land use change. It's not a, um, so it's changing the land use. And once that land use occurs is when it becomes a common plan of development. So that's the answer. And that's, it's a, it may not, sound right but it, it's what i've been told in terms of the law and basically how we apply it uh, throughout the county single parcels are not part of a common plan unless they have a plan that has been approved by the county um, and shows those different elements and different phasing of the project which again we're trying to address with this incremental development change in the ordinance to capture these incremental development type projects. And it, it probably could have, it would have applied here because there is a driveway on this one. It, it wouldn't have caught the, the building because that's on a different parcel, but it would have included, what we're trying to do is collect, uh, con to cumulatively collect all of the cumul cumulative um, land disturbance plus any proposed disturbance. And if that would exceed our threshold of 10,000, then we would require a plan. Uh, let's go to Lonnie and then uh, Ann. Yeah, so, so just to point out again, in 2014, um, our water protection ordinance that we had then was a perpetual, required a perpetual buffer, which would have applied here and prevented this situation. Um, and we've had, several, we've had several years of looking at extreme health initiatives to try and you know, involving lengthy public meetings and citizen participation. When um, when the water protection ordinance was gutted in 2014, removing protections, there was no public input. And I know you didn't have a role in that, Frank, but I think it's just worth for people to know that that, that happened. 
And, and so I think the other thing too is, is really thinking about the, the buffers. And in, in my opinion, even if a stream is piped, you know, it becomes an out of, out of sight, out of mind issue. And all those, you know, as you walk down the street and you see these little grates, a lot of those little grates within, um, within cities go directly into streams that are underground. And so the need for buffers and to protect that water doesn't go away just because the stream is underneath underneath the ground. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I, I certainly hope it's something the county can fix. Well, can I speak to that before we go to you, Ann? Um, one thing we can do and consider, uh, at least consider doing is to require all of impervious areas to go through some kind of treatment. Um, you know, there's the issue about off, offsite treatment credits um, and that we can't prohibit that. So I don't know how that would play in, but I do recall um, back before I came county engineer um, that and this was, I don't know if it was up until the time I joined or became county engineer where the previous county engineer would require that. Um, so maybe 2014 that changed also. And you have your hand up. Thank you, and I'm sorry I was late. Uh, storm technical difficulties, but I'm finally here. Frank, thank you for this uh, explanation. And each time I hear some discussion, I understand some things and also have more questions. So I'll just have a couple and they may not be able to be answered tonight. But to start out, I'm very encouraged by what you said about the proposals for doing away with the 10,000 square feet and having um, getting away with this incremental business. Because if that had already happened, then we would have had a different trajectory for this particular project. Where I stumble is there is over a two-year-old um, control agreement with the current owner of one parcel saying that the owner of the other parcel has control. And yet that's not recognized as, as any kind of linkage between those two. And so then the original, the piping in August, which was done before any permits were granted by DEQ, by the way, um, that happened. So the, I guess my question really is what is required to be stipulated, provided, sworn to whatever, when one pipe something, because I hope there are some requirements of, for a need to do it. We know it's worse for the environment in every way. So what need has to be shown and what was shown in August by the engineer for this project before uh, they did the work? Or was there anything at all? Well, first, this one didn't require a permit from the Corps. It was a non-reporting, it's called a non-reporting permit, which means all they had to do, they didn't even have to notify the core because, because they were below the thresholds for core permitting. They were below 10 cubic yards of fill and they were below 300 lineal feet of stream. So Vinny, is, Vinny told me this did not require them to notify or required, it didn't require a permit. They don't, they could have gone and downloaded the, the core permit. You can download a non-reporting permit from the core website or from wherever. I, I don't know exactly where it is, but, um, and if you meet all of the, th all of the criteria in that permit, then you don't need to notify. Wow. Okay. So that's the first time I've heard that after about 25 conversations. So that's it's actually, helpful. it's that's in the emails. Helpful. It's in the emails. And well, so I've, I've heard yeah. the non-reporting non <laughs> term, but I didn't know what it meant until you know, okay. That. Um, so thank you for that. If the the single parcel, it sounds like what we have right now is that you have to have a development project and to destroy something in order to get protection for the stream that's on a parcel. I mean, for my property, we've got five different streams going through here, and I, it's my moral obligation to take care of them. But the county can't do anything to make me. Is what I think I'm understanding you to say, even though they drain right into drinking water and things like that. 
No, no, no. I'm not saying that. I think that if, you know, if the Corps got notified about, you know, 10 cubic yards is not a lot, right? Right. It really is not One a lot. One big of dump dirt. truck. Okay. Yeah. So if you do more than 10 cubic yards, the Corps is going to be involved. The Corps is not going to willy nilly, and, and, and he didn't say it this way, but there are different levels of streams in the county. Um, not to downplay this stream. This was a, a ditch that was cut out in a old farm field. Mm-hmm. Um, so this, not putting words in Vinny's mouth, and so I won't even say it, but there are different levels of streams and they have different um, criteria for or different um, ratings for different streams. So if you have a, you know, the Doyles, they would say, no way, you know, what are you thinking? Unless there's like a, you know, unless it's like a box culvert for a driveway, we would first try to ask to get them to do a bridge. But so there's different, again, levels of impacts. Okay. And they may not allow, for instance, they've changed their position on the North Point project where that rezoning, I don't know how many years ago that rezoning was, was allowed or um, was approved. 2006, 2006, yeah. I think. Yeah, and, and DEQ is also involved. And DEQ, they, they've now recently told them they can't do what they previously proposed. So, <laughs> so my point there is, is that they won't just allow somebody to go and fill in streams willy-nilly. And I think that this one was discussed, this one was discussed beforehand. They did notify Vinny beforehand, even though they didn't have to. Um, so in regarding the with the agreement, that's a private agreement between two private parties, and the county has no jurisdiction on those private agreements about who has the rights to make decisions for the property. I just okay. wanted to speak to that. Well, thank you. Um, and I guess the last takeaway, which is we can't do anything about right now, is that if one does an application for a land use change, It would be great if everything would freeze in place and people would not be allowed to do land disturbance, push things around, chop down all the trees, all those things under some guise of agricultural or forestry. And then lo and behold, come back and say, oh, well, we've made this big mess and now we're going to fix it by doing this big development with 157 houses. Um, So that has always been a concern to me that so much happens when nobody is or can look and then we allow people to just go on with it and so i hope there will be delays built in where if some destruction happens that they can't use it for five years or something like we do with those roads that uh that came in after you after you came and stopped that farm road nonsense um okay uh i think that that's all that i have to add and you may have some answers thank you well, I just wanted to respond. <laughs> Maybe not answers, but I think we have that for site plans, where if somebody sits, submits a site plan, they can't do anything until, you know, the site plan's approved. Um, I don't think that's, in fact, I, I've been, I re, I'm not 100% sure. I'm 90, 90% sure that that's not in the, the case for a zoning map amendment, because again, it's changing the zoning. Um, but that's something we should look into if it's not in place, right? So yeah. that's on the zoning side. Great, thank you. You're welcome. That we're, we're coming close to the end of our planned meeting time. So I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. If we go to Mark, and then I see that we have a hand up in the attendees, uh, Matt actually does hand up. So Mark, and then we'll go to Matt. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I'm gonna make this this real quick. This, this my comment's kind of geared for Ms. Malik. Um, you know, if, if this whole stream thing wasn't brought up by um, some community members back in, in January. This kind of, this probably would have slid under the radar. And I think what, what kind of, what I, I think I'm looking for maybe some um, board of supervisor uh, leadership here, uh, not just you, Ms. Mouth, but the entire board. How did this, no, and not an answer now, but this, this really did seem to, fit into the county's climate action plan. And and my concern is how many other ordinances do we have that do not align to the climate action plan that we need to relook, such as um, the water protection ordinance uh, going forward? Because 
a lot of developments happening in Jose. It's happening in the rest of the county, especially on the north side of Alamaral. And there's massive amounts of trees and land disturbance going on. And it just it just seems that we've got a climate action plan on paper, but then there's no maybe there wasn't a really good review of ordinances to further get in line to achieve the county's climate action plan. Thanks. And you are absolutely correct that there had that alignment has not happened yet and is something that we hope to as the climate action is undertaken throughout the comprehensive plan as that's why this comp plan process is so incredibly important for everybody to watch every single day uh, because it is the climate action is a little piece of paper laid on top and it is we've been working very hard with all the departments have been working hard over the last five years to recodify the zoning ordinance it has lots of chapters that are all in conflict with each other really and truly because of the way state changes are made and then we make changes that make us comply with the state which i think is what happened in 2014 because there was as lonnie said absolutely no debate about eviscerating the tools that frank needed to do his job uh, and so it was called technical improvements or whatever well boy i've learned to read the fine print on technical improvements ever since that happened so we have a lot of work to do and the difficulty that I, and this is 30,000 foot level, I understand in my heart and brain about climate change, but we cannot have such a tunnel that say we have to electrify everything, but we're not going to think about the destruction of forests that causes is needed for those solar facilities, not solar farms, because they're not farms, uh, solar facilities to be built. It, we can't look at things in isolation because then we're causing more trouble than we're doing. And that's gonna be the big, big challenge as we go forward uh, is to try to keep all these different juggling balls in the air at once. And, um, but, but you, you nailed it as far as having, being able to tie these things together much, much better. Thank you. Lonnie, we'll go to you briefly and then we'll go to Matt and the uh, entities. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention too, there's not just the, the county's climate action plan, but there's also the, the county's biodiversity action plan uh, developed by the, the Admiral County Natural Heritage Committee. And that called out explicitly um, stream culverting uh, with a series of policy recommendations that the Natural Heritage Committee had made um, for years about preventing culverting of streams. And so if, if you're not familiar with that, that plan, that's another thing I would really like to see people look to and, and follow. Frank, please go ahead. I just wanted to uh, make a comment that comprehensive plan is not the ordinance. So whatever's in the comp plan, as you mentioned, Mark, needs to be, make its way into the ordinances because that's how um, we enforce things in the county through the ordinance. It's not through the comp plan. That's a guide, same thing with the master plans. Uh, but if the ordinance doesn't prohibit something or or doesn't allow something that's in the comp plan, then it doesn't come to fruition. And Valor, you may be able to speak to that better than I, but that's my understanding. And it's a, thank you, Frank. It's an important lesson for us to keep in mind here, right? Having just gone through our own master planning process in Crozet, let's not forget, you know, the, these master plans are wonderful and they can inform things, but they are not necessarily you know, self-enforcing. They do require further action and commitment on our part, all of us, um, to continue to make them become a reality. Um, uh, Carolyn, can we unmute Matt? I believe he has his hand up. Thank you, Matt. Go ahead. Hey, yeah. Um, essentially, there's only one viable option for this property. Uh, County has approved, you know, thousands and thousands of homes in Curzay, um, yet we don't have really any additional park space. Um, just recently, I learned that, uh, we're probably not going to have fireworks this year because there's houses too close. It's increased the cost of the fireworks display, so it's prohibitive for our community. Um, so really, the only viable option is for the county to acquire the property and develop it into parks. We need ball fields. We need basketball courts. We need trails. We need nature space. Um, so that's really the only solution here, and I hope the county pursues that. I'd also be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to tell the county engineer we've been asking for a crosswalk and sidewalks on St. George Avenue since the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and we 
begged and pleaded for the county to include that in the Curse Master Plan, yet y'all chose not to. Um, so I would once again request the county uh, to pursue a legal and safe crosswalk across St. or Curse Avenue at St. George. Um, again, late 80s, early 90s, we started requesting that. We've been paying property taxes for almost 40 years. You'd think the county would either refund all the property taxes that we paid so that we could build it ourselves, or the county would finally get their act together and work with VDOT to build that. So I hope as an engineer, or as the county's engineer, uh, you would take this request seriously, and we would love to see it materialize in 2023. Frank, I don't know if you had any response. Sure, please. Sure, I will just uh, say, Matt, that's probably something you need to go. The county county engineer doesn't make um, requests for these types of sidewalk improvements. And I think you can speak to how that process is. But um, I wanted to make the comment about Montclair and um, that this is not this has not gone to the board yet so the board is still yet to approve this project and it still could be turned down by the board the board has that option to turn down this project or approve it and so i just wanted to make that point Great. well thank you frank and, and thank you for joining us i know a lot of um, uh, folks here on the committee and the community had questions about this project and and i appreciate you coming tonight and sharing you know, your input and helping us understand more about not only this specific project the water protection ordinance more generally and I, I think all of us very much appreciate the sort of forward-looking thoughts and revisions going forward that might help correct some of the, the loopholes or the issues that came up in this particular project but could certainly you know come up time and again as we look forward in future projects sure i just want to respond one more time to matt and matt it's not to brush you off from my perspective i just want you to get to the right person so that your request can be heard and it's i think it's there can be a request made through Kevin. Um, I'm blanking on Kevin McDermott, and he takes requests regarding sidewalks or road repairs and other types of infrastructure throughout the county. So I can provide that uh, email for you if you like, or a phone number, um, or we can provide it through the, the um, you know, somehow through the meeting minutes or somehow. Just let me know. Thank you very thank you, much. Frank. Yeah. Yes. Thank yeah. you, Frank. And Matt, I see your hand is still up, but we're we're gonna wrap up. We're coming to the close of the meeting. And I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So um, I do want to leave just a few minutes for any announcements that people have or any committee business that might come up. Are there any announcements that people need to make? I'll share just one. Um, I still haven't heard of Rachel. I know that things are still in flux in terms of returning to in-person meetings, but I have spoken to the folks at the Crozet Library, and we have reserved the large meeting room for the second Wednesday of every month for sort of the indefinite future starting in August. Um, I told them if we are not back by August, we'll cancel that and we'll just pick up the next month. But in sort of hope springs eternal, uh, we are reserved there. So hopefully whenever we are ready to resume in-person meetings, we will be in the large meeting room in the Crozet Library. Um, is there free? Right, as, of right yeah, sorry, now, as of right now, the plan for return in person is September. So September. Okay. I will, that could uh, obviously change, but that's the plan right now. Okay, great. Well, then I'll reach back out to the library and uh, we, we are set on that front. Um, I do want to make sure we do have a couple of new members who are joining us tonight. I know we have Mallory and Lonnie who are joining us, and I don't think we've actually sort of formally met them yet, so I did want to give just a couple of minutes to introduce themselves, um, since they'll be joining us uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, why don't we start with Mallory? Hey, uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity, uh, Mallory. So uh, I, I live in the Western Ridge neighborhood. I've been in Crozet now for 10 years. Um, exactly, I moved here in, in 2012. Um, and uh, my, my background's in mechanical engineering. Um, I went to UVA and graduated from there. That's kind of what brought me to the area. And uh, yeah, just generally concerned with, um, you know, environmental issues and, and really glad to be more involved with the Crozet community. Great, thank you, Valerie. It's great to have you aboard. Lonnie. Yes, um, so I grew up in Albemarle County, went to um, Western Albemarle, um, grew up in Ivy, lived in Batesville for a while, and now we live in Sugar Hollow. 
I've served for many years on the Albemarle County Natural Heritage Committee, which sort of safeguards, you know, monitors uh, biodiversity in the county and pr promotes protection of natural resources. Um, and then um, I've also served as an elected um, director on the Thomas Jefferson Soil Water Conservation District. Um, and, um, and now I've recently been appointed to the Planning Commission. Um, I will be stepping down as, as director for the Stormwater Conservation District um, before my first meeting. Great. Well, thank you, Lonnie. Thank you for introducing yourself. It's great to have you aboard as well. Um, are there any announcements from anyone else? I will note that we won't be meeting uh, next month. Oh, sorry, Anne, please go ahead. I guess I was hoping that Ali or somebody would be here to be more official, but I will share that while there may not be fireworks on the 2nd of July, there will be the parade and the music and the food and the community gathering. And I do hope that everyone will come and meet new neighbors and see old friends. And it's one of the great events that makes Crozet so, so special. And so I am totally discouraged and I don't think it was distance or cost the, the but it was the availability of the shooters and well i i am here and i'm sorry i'm sorry oh, I didn't there you are oh good I'm okay i'm here okay. <laughs> i so just anyway, i didn't i didn't want everybody anything. to come and it, i the, the distance of the townhomes is an issue and they were going to be smaller mortars um because of the distance um and uh and and the price was um higher whether they, they didn't cite the down homes as the price increase but either way they they won't do it even if we come up with the money they they won't do it so we'll see what happens next but we're still putting on the event and um and the parade so hopefully um people people come and we still need donations because even without the fireworks um show the event itself costs money um you know, renting the stage, the sound system, the, you know, trash, the security, um, all of that. Um, so consider donating and um, yeah, hopefully come, we will still have the food trucks and the band and um, something to do at the end of the parade. Allie, where's the best place to make those donations? Um, it's through this, the, um, the uh, crozetcommunity.org um tim tolson's uh the the, the crozet community association all of that is is there and you can also just um write a check to the crozet board of trade and um anyway let me know if you have trouble finding out how to um how to send money you can also donate at the gate at the event thank you ali um and your hand is up did you have anything else or is that just a loose hand no problem i did want to take a moment too and also thank ali very much for reprising her role as chair, even though she was <laughs> she was off the hook. She stepped in last month and I greatly appreciate it. I did want to recognize one other person who's, who's not with us, but she was for a long, long time. And that is uh, Alison Rabel, uh, the longtime local news reporter for the Daily Progress who covered these meetings for years and years and years and years and did a fantastic job keeping everybody informed about what was happening in Crozet. Uh, she recently uh, left the Daily Progress, uh, but I did want to thank her and recognize her for terrific work for many years, keeping us all informed about what was going on in local government in our area. Uh, with that, again, we do not have a meeting in July. Uh, we're taking a break, and I can recommend the Okanichi State Park has lovely cabins. If you're looking for a place to go, they have very reliable internet service too uh, on your phone. So. Uh, Okaniji State Park, it's only two and a half hours away. We will be meeting, the next CCAC meeting is tentatively scheduled for August 10th at 7 p.m. Opportunities for the public to access and participate in the electronic meeting will be posted at a later date in accordance with emergency ordinance number 20-A16 and open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. If there is no further business, then I believe we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. We will see you in August. Have a great summer. Thank you, everyone.